Warning, Crescent City Crime contains violent and explicit content that is not suitable for a younger audience. Some topics may be disturbing or triggering for sensitive listeners. Listen at your own risk. Thank you for listening to Crescent City Crime. If you wish to further support the show, please make sure to like, rate, and review this podcast on your preferred listening platform. We can also be found on YouTube at Crescent City Crime. You can discuss episodes with other listeners in our private Facebook group or follow us on Twitter. You can also visit our merch store. All of our social media links, show notes, sources, and more can be found in our blog, nolacrimepodcast.com. That's nola, N-O-L-A, crimepodcast.com. We are now on Patreon. On our Patreon, we feature discussions about movies that revolve around crime and offer exclusive merch. If you would like to hear that extra content from us twice a month and access exclusive merch, subscribe to us at patreon.com slash crime. We would appreciate it if you help spread the word about Crescent City Crime. Tell a friend or aggressively scream our podcast name at your enemies. The music used in this episode is the Black Fingerprint, and it was composed by Dylan Owen. Welcome to Crescent City Crime, dear listeners. I'm Tracy. And I'm Brian. And, of course, thank you to everybody who has been keeping their ears on us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And... Welcome to the new Facebook members who have joined our group over the last couple of weeks. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. (laughs) And today is the final installment of the Telly Hankton series. Well, miniseries, really. And in the last episode, we talked about the murder that finally ended Telly Hankton's career. And we're going to examine the chain of crimes a little bit more deeply and talk about some of the court proceedings. In a previous episode, we talked about Daniel Hampton, but we are going to go more into this particular witness intimidation case today. When Telly Hankton was brought to trial in 2011 for the murder of Darnell Stewart, Daniel Hampton provided an alibi for him. In her testimony, she initially told the court that she saw Hankton's face on a TV news show as a suspect in Stewart's killing. The day after, she said she met him at a hotel for drinks. Before the trial, Daniel Hampton did not contact the police to give a statement. The state did not know anything about her until she showed up as a witness for the defense. Prosecutor Margaret Parker called her testimony outright, outright lies. Because of her actions, she left the jury with questions. Why didn't Hankton contact her for help right away? And why didn't she come forward for two years? How do you know that Daniel Hampton lied to you? The prosecutor asked the jury. You know because she didn't have it all thought through. As a result, the jury hung and a mistrial was declared. However, in the end, justice did prevail. In October 2011, Telly Hankton was found guilty of the murder of Darnell Stewart and was sentenced to life in prison by the state of Louisiana. Means uh, Angola. He probably is probably uh, serving that in Angola. Um, Not a fun place to be. No, no, not 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 fun at all. Nobody wants to go there. And obviously, at the at the heart of this whole thing, okay, is what's called entitlement. Okay on a very narcissistic and grandiose scale here. In fact, every crime that's ever committed originates from a sense of entitlement. You see, you, you know, where you deserve this no matter what, you, you should have this, and you're willing to do absolutely anything for it to get it because you absolutely must have it. Right. And you're willing to, you're willing to break, to break any and all laws and, this sense of entitlement makes matters even worse when you're willing to do absolutely anything outside of the law, regardless of how heinous or inhumane it is, to hold on to your ill-gotten gains through this 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 sense of entitlement. And 
you know what what happened with the Hangtons that that's the that's the eventual outcome mm-hmm. of this colossal narcissistic sociopathic sense of entitlement that the, that they had and then you know i do sometimes wonder if sociopathy can be learned because if you're a person who is i don't know a kind person a good person right and then you're around all this influence of people who are not so good that feeds into a certain part of, of personalities and it, and it all becomes normalized and accepted. And you see this on bigger scales too, right? Like when you think about Jeffrey Epstein and the people who were in his circle who did terrible things to people you wouldn't be doing that if you did not have some sort of influence. If you didn't have people around you telling you it was okay. Yes. Yes. Um, that, 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 that is true. Yeah. There is such a thing as, as sociopathic behavior that is taught, but of course for the sociopathic behavior to be taught there, there has to be a, someone who was a lifelong sociopath at the heart of it. Of course. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not easy to understand for people who are, most people are not sociopaths. Okay. Uh, And it's, it's not easy for the non-sociopath to understand because they're, they're always asking that, that, that age old question of. um, How could they do that? Yeah. Oh, well, how could someone do that? Well, and the explanation is how how that person could do that is that their values are warped and twisted and this sociopathic personality is what allows the we say technically the advantage to being a sociopath is that you're uninhibited in 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 your ambitions you'll do absolute when when they say any, you know, anything for success, whatever it takes for success, they truly mean whatever it takes. I, I do also want to point out that just because, you know, somebody is a sociopath, if, if they are, it doesn't always manifest in a chain of violence. It can manifest in having a position of control like a, a, C, a CEO of a company or a politician. Yes. Now, now these the types of sociopaths that murder people, you know, of course, those are psychopaths. Okay, but the there's many more people who are actual who are sociopaths who are are willing to to bend to bend rules, bend the law for financial gain, and and to to get to get ahead and to get ahead in life with mostly within the law, though. Okay, it doesn't mean these people are ethical at all. These people really don't have ethics. So yes, there are people. Many there are many politicians who are who are sociopaths. Right. Okay. Because they when they make when they when they make these lawful and legal decisions, they they actually don't really care about the people that it affects. Right. That's true. They don't. They they see everyone as just numbers. Well, we on this podcast do not believe that you are a number. You are a person. That's right. That's right. A person. It pains us to watch people suffer. Obviously, psychopaths and sociopaths do not. Uh, they're not empathic at all. No. And we're we're going to move on from this sidebar because we still do have quite a bit to get through. In the year 2000, the first violent act committed by Walter Porter, Kevin Jackson, Andre, and Telly Hankton was the murder of Telly's cousin, Venice Brosley. She was killed over the, over the suspected theft of drugs and money. So they're killing family members of their own. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> psy- 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 psychopathic behavior there. Yeah. Now, Brian Broussard, who was an associate of Telly Hankton, decided he wanted to open up his own drug business. He he sold drugs in the Hankton's territory, 
deciding that he could not allow Brian Broussard to step on his territory till he had him murdered. This action was really the thing. I, I guess if you arrive in the drug world, this was what made Telly Hankton arrive. Yeah, well, he felt disrespected because he did not, uh, he was not approached first. And th this was not discussed. The, the, uh, this member of the family just arbitrarily went ahead and, and did this. Right. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of like, um, this kind of vaguely reminds me of like the Randazzo's family with the king cakes. You had different oh, parts. Yeah. You had the Randazzo's family in New Orleans, which there's several different Randazzo's bakeries, and their king cakes are very similar. None of them are completely identical. And and there there's different bakeries and different formulas because of family drama. Right, right. So they, but the the Randazzo's have still been around and been able to sell king cakes. For decades. Without killing there. each other. Be right. right. <laughs> because they didn't settle these disputes by killing each other. No, they, murdering each other. They outbake each other. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. It's it's uh it's a family it's a family rivalry. Yeah. Uh, that is an intriguing part of, of New Orleans uh, Mardi Gras King Cake lore. Which one day we will have an episode about that in particular. Now, after the death of Brian Broussard and Kelly Hankton's arrival into the drug world. This was what, where, if you look at the chain of violence, this is where the killings between the Hankton empire and those who they perceived as threats to, to their business really started. In April of 2005, George Jackson put out a hit on Brian Broussard and Darnell Stewart. In April 2005, George Jackson put out a hit on Brian Broussard and Darnell Stewart. Telly Hankton gave a gun to someone, we're not certain who, while they were at Telly's mother's house. Within minutes, the associates shot and killed Brian Broussard, but Darnell Stewart escaped. Then two years later in 2007, Troy and Telly Hankton had that, that rolling gun battle with Darnell Stewart and Jesse Reed. and then. In 2008, Telly Hankton again shot at them. Then, that same year, in 2008, from May to June, Shirley Hankton and the other Hankton family members and friends used their personal properties to secure a $1 million bond for Telly Hankton. So it's a million dollar bond. And when you pay, or when your bond is a million dollars, how much do you actually have to pay? If you pay it to a bail bondsman, it's ten percent. So that's uh, one hundred thousand dollars to pay it to a bail bondsman. That's between you and the court if you put your property up. So they had to have a million dollars worth of real estate. Yes. To to put up with the courts to make mm -hmm. sure that they appear in court. Now, of course, forfeiture of this money or property is not exactly arbitrary. Because there's always a period of time during which a bail bondsman or a bounty hunter or even friends or family to, to track down the bail, the bail jumper and get them to court. There's a period of time that you have to still get them to court and preserve preserve the bond. Right. right. Yeah. Now, of course, you can do a cash bond with a criminal court. Would they, Which of course that that right there that would also that would literally be a million dollars. So it's literally a million dollars in cash they could take to a court of law. Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whereas if uh, of course if you're dealing with a bail bondsman, then you pay them a hundred thousand dollars, they get to keep that hundred thousand dollars as a fee. Right. And they're putting up this million dollars on your behalf. Or, well, nine hundred thousand dollars technically, right? Cause no, no, the bail bond. 000. Well. No, because the fee doesn't really count there. Oh, okay. The bail bondsman's literally putting up one one million to the court. Wow. And their fee for it is a hundred thousand dollars, but that's not what happened in this in this instance. No, it is not. In fact, would you like to know what happened in this instance? Sure. So Telly Hankton released on a one million dollar bond. Do you think that he stayed out of trouble? Of course not. No. Of course not. 
On June 20th, 2009, Telly Hankton, Walter Porter, and Kevin Jackson shot and killed Jesse Reed. A total of five guns were used to commit that particular murder. They shot Jesse Reed over 50 times. And Telly Hankton's bond was revoked, and he was put back in a jail. Now, I mean, apparently he thought he was going to get away with this. Apparently, I mean, this is the kind of individual who thinks he, he can, you know, shoot his way out of trouble mm. all, all the time, uh, which, well, really, I mean, let's, let's be realistic. You know, this is, this is his warped mind coming up with these, coming up with these solutions that are third world based in nature. I mean, like, like this business of, of a family member disrespecting you and uh, making a move against you. This kind of, this is reminiscent of North Korea, whereas Kim Jong-un has, he has siblings. Right. But they stay in line. They don't move against him because if they, any of them did, siblings, sibling or not, he would, he would kill them. And this is, this is the same, this is the same narcissistic, psychotic mindset. Right except it's on a much smaller scale. Later that same year, in fact, less than a month after, in July, on the 4th of July, Walter, Walter Porter murdered a witness to Jesse Reed's murder. Then later that year, a Hankton associate, while being held in the Orleans Parish Jail, put out a hit on John Matthews, who we talked about in our last episode. Then on October the 24th of 2010, Porter shot John Matthews, who would live and go on to testify against the Hanktons. In, on October the 15th, 2011, Telly Hankton was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Darnell Stewart. And less than a week after that, Porter shot and killed Curtis Matthews. And you're right, Brian, Telly Hankton was sentenced to life in prison within the federal system, and he is currently a guest of Angola Prison. <laughs> now, in a federal court, in federal court, after a letter was read from the widow of Matthew Curtis, Walter Porter yelled out, I would like to object. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's always funny, okay? No matter how many times it happens in a federal or, or state court where someone who's seen too many television shows or movies in, involving courtrooms uh, decides to apply their their armchair legal expertise. We're all armchair legal experts, don't you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, all my years of experience with watching Law and Order, why I'm practically an attorney. <laughs> I, I know, I know. My, my experience in law enforcement and my criminal justice degree, none of, none of that means a thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just haven't seen enough I haven't watched as much, as much court drama as you. I know. Yeah. Darn it. I'm the legal authority in this household. <sighs> <laughs> oh, well. Well, after Porter objected, the judge shot back at him, oh, you didn't shoot them in the back of the head. This is U.S. Dis US District Judge Martin Feldman. And then Porter responded, I didn't shoot nobody, sir. I remember that quote. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> didn't shoot the body, sir. <laughs> Judge Feldman ordered him to be quiet, but Porter defied him. He claimed that critical exculpatory evidence had been suppressed. One of his attorneys, Stephen Lemoyne, described Porter as intellectually and emotionally impaired as a result of abuse suffered as a child, which... Side note, I really dislike it when somebody tries to use the abuse excuse because a lot of people go through pretty heinous things and they don't and they don't kill other people. Exactly. Being being abused as a child is does not turn you into a psychopath. Judge Feldman ordered Porter removed from the courtroom. The sentence for him was seven concurrent life prison terms plus ten years. He killed at least seven people for the Hankton Empire. Well, I, I guess he got, I mean, for his belligerence in the court, um, 
I, maybe he got like I don't know three three extra life terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, not that it really matters, but the two the two people in the criminal justice system who you have to respect, whether you like them or not, whether you like what they have to say or not, is one, the police officer, which is the most powerful person in the criminal justice system, because that is the person who puts you into the system in the first place. And then two, the judge, because the the judge has a lot to say about how much time you're going to be in jail or the difference between jail time or probation or an acquittal or mistrial. You know, bottom line is that no matter what happens with the police, no matter what happens in the courtroom, you have to be on your best behavior. You have to, I mean, even though, even if you're putting on an act, you, you have to be on the best behavior of your entire life. Andre Hankton, I agree with you though, Brian, I really mm -hmm. do. You, you really do need to be polite to the judge, whether you want to be or not. Andre Hankton, who was 38 years old during his sentencing, declined to comment as he was sentenced to life for his part in the murder of Darnell Stewart. Kevin Jackson was sentenced to life for his part in the murder of Jesse Reed. His attorney, Michael Fa Fowler, I think that's like F-A-W-E-R, Fowler, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. pressed for leniency. He asked Judge Feldman to, to veer below the mandatory life sentence However, the request was denied. Kevin Jackson did not address his guilt or innocence. He sympathized with the victims while adding, we have victims on this side as well. I'm not an evil person. I'm not a monster. I'm a loving, caring person. Along with his role in Reed's murder, this caring person was found guilty on the main racketeering charge, but was acquitted on four other counts. Well, it's possible his sociopathic behavior was, was learned behavior, but uh, guilty nonetheless, and he, he knew everything he did that was wrong. He knew absolutely what he did was wrong. In fact, virtually every criminal who goes through the system knows they're doing something wrong. That's e right. Even, even, even people who are mentally impaired, okay? Yes, I'm going to go on that, uh, out on that limb. And we are going to circle back to Michael Anderson, who, if you remember, he was the person who was initially sentenced to death for the Central City Massacre. Whatever, whatever became of him and what role did he play in all the hoopla? Well, in 2016, he became a witness for the prosecution in the federal trial of Telly Hankton. Michael Anderson told what he knew of the drug dealing and murders around Central City where he and Hankton had both lived. Michael Anderson said that Telly Hankton was the exclusive cocaine supplier for the neighborhood. He said that Hankton dealt only in quarter and half kilos and never sold less than an ounce, and that he never sold to street users. He also said that Hankton owned several mo motorcycles that he would ride late at night when he went out to do business. Anderson explained that when he and Hankton were both in the Orleans Parish House of Detention together in 2009, they secretly met they secretly met with each other. Anderson had just received his death sentence and Hankton was awaiting trial for the murder of Darnell Stewart. Oh, side note, uh, House of Detention has been shut down subsequently. Uh, as of even the 1990s, House of Detention was very archaic. Very dungeon like, mm. and it got shut down not too long after the uh, well, this is for another episode. After people were coming and going as they please and sneaking out, we will get how into that. obsolete the facility <laughs> had, had become. But I actually worked worked a few shifts in the house of detention, and yes, it was uh, a miserable place that was very dungeon like, it looked straight out of the, the 1940s. Mm. Okay. Anderson had hidden a cell phone in a drain pipe, and Hankton asked him to make a phone call to his cousin. Hankton wanted to put a hit out on a witness that was set to testify against him. In return, 
Telly Hankton claimed that he could help Anderson avoid the death penalty. It is unclear if Telly Hankton was able to actually help him, but either way, the murder charges and death penalty against Anderson were overturned in 2009. In spite of this, Anderson later pled no contest to five manslaughter charges for his role in the Central City Massacre and is currently serving a life sentence in federal federal prison, which is is probably a lot better than being on death row in Angola. A lot better. The the federal yeah, the normally like if it's a federal facility, it's much softer walls than a county facility much softer walls than Angola. The exception to this are instances where you have uh, county sheriffs who who hold federal inmates primarily because of the necessity, not only because of the necessity, but because the federal government pays more to house an inmate than state government does or uh, our municipal government. Our tax dollars at work. Yeah, our tax dollars at work. And that, that's where sheriffs really come out ahead, housing federal inmates. Because it costs it it literally costs the same huh. to to house a, a for the state to house an inmate for the federal government to house an inmate in a state facility the actual cost is the same they're just collecting more money from the feds for it you see of course it, they are of it's course a, it it is it is a racket and it was one that our member of Orleans Parish criminal sheriff at the time when there was a distinction between civil and criminal sheriff in Orleans Parish. You know, Sheriff Charles C. Fody Jr., which he was very adamant about the junior part, he he had quite a budget from housing federal inmates. He headed down to to quite quite the racket. Um, and this is when you worked in the in the jail, right? Yes, yeah. And there were times there were times in which I got to work on the on the federal prison tier, and that was one of the best places in the jail to work because <laughs> federal federal inmates are, are easier to deal with than. Uh, state inmates, pretty much, mm-hmm. because at at the time some of them were 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 people from Department of Immigration uh, detaining foreigners. Was when that that's a whole other topic. It is that that previous indefinite detention of foreigners that sheriffs across the country were all for, because it was a steady flow of, of, cash. of budgetary yeah, cash. Yeah. yeah. You didn't know how long these 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 foreigners were going to sit in jail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't even know. It's it's like in the modern sense, it's like de- detainees at Gitmo. Right. For example, it was practically the same situation, except on our except in our on our shores. Like I said, our tax dollars at work, isn't it great? Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, Brian, what would you say if I told you? Because you kind of did touch on the corrupt. What if I told you that there were some dirty dealings by the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office regarding Michael Anderson? I, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't be surprised at all. Because that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> when Michael Anderson was initially charged, the Orleans Parish District Attorney at the time, Eddie Jordan, he dropped the murder charges against Anderson in 2007. His reason was that there were conflicting witness statements and that Eddie Jordan felt that there wasn't enough evidence to build a case. However, just a few weeks later, there was a newly elected district attorney, Leon Cannizzaro. Cannizzaro went on to charge Anderson with the killings, and a jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. In 2010, the attorneys for Michael Anderson discovered that the office of Leon Cannizzaro had withheld a videotaped interview with the only eyewitness. The interview was conducted by prosecutors and New Orleans Police Department detectives, contradicted the testimony she gave at trial. As a result of this, the murder charges and death sentence for Michael Anderson were vacated. They withheld evidence that absolved Michael Anderson. Well, that's the unfortunate weakness of our criminal justice system, as great as our system is, as much as our system does work, it's still run by human beings who have their own agendas. That's very true. And I feel like because this was a high profile, the the Central City Massacre was a high profile case. 
and people really wanted somebody to go to jail for it. Yes, there was a tremendous public outcry after that happened. It's the kind of thing that does not happen often in this town where you have multiple juveniles murdered in a very short period of time or during one encounter. That That's actually quite rare in this area, whereas unfortunately, like, for example, of a, of a, of a city of a city and city suburbs where this is commonplace is unfortunately Chicago. Yes. So it was quite a shock to this area. Leon Canazero's office had also secretly rewarded a jailhouse informant named Ronnie Morgan for his testimony against Michael Anderson. In 2009, Leon Canazero wrote a letter to the assistant United States attorney asking that Morgan's sentence for armed robbery be reduced or diminished. As a result of this, Ronnie Morgan was permitted to withdraw a guilty plea he had entered for armed robberies, and his 15-year sentence was vacated. He was paroled in 2013. One judge called it the deal of the century. However, old habits die hard, and in January 2014, Ronnie Morgan was charged with armed robbery in St. Bernard Parish. He is in prison and recently petitioned to be moved from state to federal prison. <laughs> yeah, I bet I bet he just liked that. Do you have any experience with jailhouse informants at all? No, no. Uh, it's <laughs> and it's funny. Okay, the perspective of someone who's never worked in a jailhouse concerning this type of thing, you you tend to think more of jailhouse informants from the outside than from the inside because you work on the inside of the jail with these inmates of course have time on their hands and they get very creative and inventive so a good bit of the time they're they're simply making stuff up funny they're tr they're they're, tra they're trash talking funny you say that because According to the National Registry of Exonerations, jailhouse informants have been involved in more than 160 exonerations, but in capital cases, jailhouse informants are the leading cause of wrongful convictions. In this particular instance, a man was wrongfully put on death row because of an overzealous, newly elected district attorney combined with bad information from a jailhouse informant. Yeah, yeah. This, for the most part, we're talking about dishonest people who are trying to make their own deals with the system. For the, for the most part. So the majority of the time, you really have to take what these, uh, what these inmates say with a grain of salt. Because you'll hear all kind of crazy stuff in a jail. Now, while charges were never officially bought against Telly Hankton, for the Central City Massacre, it is known in legal circles that he was the one who actually pulled the trigger on the gun that ended the lives of Marcus and Arsenio Hunter, Warren Simon, Iram Taylor, and Reggie Dantzler. And that is the story of the rise and fall of the Hankton Crime Empire and the Central City Massacre. We are done. A, a cautionary tale of... <laughs> where, a, where a criminal sense of entitlement can can take you, whereas you can, in your own mind, get, get to the top of the world and as, as fast as you get it is as, as fast as you can lose it. Because in the end, the criminal justice system does not share your sense of entitlement. And in fact, the criminal justice system has its own sense of entitlement. It's entitled to warehouse you for a fee. <laughs> and if you've committed if you've committed heinous felonies, well, no one's going to feel sorry for you just because the system is is using you for its own gain. You're getting punished so richly for what you have for what you you brought upon yourself. You know, th this it's like th there are people who, yes, another topic, who probably shouldn't be in jail because of this drug war, but the the Hangtons and their associates are an ex excellent examples of people who 
not only deserve to be in jail for what they did, but went on to prove that they don't they don't deserve to live in society at all. I I really agree. I you know, and like you said, it it is a whole other topic, but you could speculate on you know, let, let's pretend for a minute that all drugs were legal in America. All right. You could debate if that would cut out the violence because it would cut out the need for illegal transport of drugs. It would cut out the need for, it would cut out territorial disputes amongst rival drug dealers, right? Yeah. All kinds of things that it would actually get rid of. But you see, the those <laughs> people like the Hanktons and their associates, though, would have found some other criminal enterprise. Now, granted, low-level drug dealers, clockers, would have quite possibly found honest employment, which is, which is my theory there. Or they would have became politicians. <laughs> <laughs> but people who are prone to criminal behavior, you know, sociopaths and, and psychopaths who are prone to criminal behavior like the Hanktons, I, I hate to say it, with the way their with the way their lives went, they were prone to violent and criminal behavior. No matter what, they proved they were capable of it. Because here we go back again to the the legal term of the uh, the reasonable person, the type of person who you want to sit on a jury, the reasonable person who understands what's reasonable in society and understands what's unreasonable in society. This. That, that this criminal behavior of the Hanktons and their associates is not what anyone in any sane in any sane state of mind would consider to be to be reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And now, a side note here: a friend of mine who's retired from the New Orleans Police Department, Sergeant David Liang. Uh, he did arrest one of the Hanktons. Do you know which one? Uh, I think it was Telly. Telly and, Hankton himself. Yeah. Huh. It, it, and it was after it was after one of these shootings. You see, uh. with some uh, sometimes these characters get arrested after a shooting. Okay. And you know, t taken in for probable cause, and then they're la later on detectives determine they're guilty of more than what they've been arrested for. Like in this instance, it was uh, he pulled, uh, I believe it was a uh, a red light. Okay, he disregarded a red light, and uh, he recognized him and approached the vehicle with his with his hand on his service pistol, and you know he cooperated and he got out the car. And what was found on the, the floorboard was a Glock 26, 9mm, the most compact of the 9mm Glock pistols at the time. Okay, I'm not going to get into subsequent Glocks that are more compact anyway. And it had the 33-shot extended magazine originally made by Glock for the Glock 18 fully automatic machine pistol as seen in Terminator 3, the movie Terminator 3, when John Connors has that what looks to be a Glock 17, he's firing bursts, okay? But anyway, yes, it really exists, Glock 18 submachine gun pistol. And so he had this magazine sticking out, the, but the, the slide was locked. It was jammed. And there was a round of ammunition that was what's called stovepiped. It was sticking upward. It, did, it never made it in the chamber, and it jammed the slide, okay? And David believes this is the reason why he didn't get shot at when he pulled him over. Because, you see, what he did when he did this drive-by shooting was he, he grabbed the magazine, this 33-shot magazine that sticks, you know, way out the bottom of the feed well with his left hand, his support hand, tilting the feed ramp at the top of the magazine and thus forcing the gun to jam. Oh, okay. So, Quite possible, yeah, David was saved from being shot at. Maybe his life was saved because one of the Hanktons did not know how to properly shoot a Glock pistol with an extended mag. Like during World War II, you have partisans who would 
grab a Sten magazine sticking out the Sten submachine gun and have the same result. You know, you you can't grab the magazine while you're shooting. Okay. But the but uh, but this character has the rest of his life to think to think about that. He does have the rest of his life to think about that, and I. Do you think he's enjoying his stay at, at Hotel Angola? <laughs> he he's adapted to it by now. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's yeah. been ten years. They, 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 these are some very very rough individuals, and they're capable because they, they're they're able to function under very adverse circumstances, which is how they can endure, you know, mentally endure what they have to do to, uh, you know engage in this in this criminal lifestyle so they adapt they adopt really well and he's probably found he's probably at peace with the whole thing and he's enjoying himself in his little world on television and writing letters to people and you know whatever else or maybe he's the boss of the tier of the prison oh, tier maybe where he, he stays yeah this someone like him doesn't play second fiddle that's to, quite. To, to, that's to, quite true. To anybody, so he's a he's a he's a legend in his own mind, and he's likely very large and in charge where where he's where he's staying. But everybody outside knows what a little man he always was. Is the Germans' nickname for him the little man? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a very heavy topic. And I'm assuming that that's all your final thoughts. Yes, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> crime. Well, crime, crime doesn't, doesn't pay. pay. No, nope. no, it does not. So don't do it. Next week is our monthly break from murder and mayhem. And we're going to come at you with coffee talk. And we're going to get into a little bit of New Orleans history. We're going to talk about the very first movie theater. That ever, that ever opened in America, which was located, guess where, Brian? In New Orleans. On Canal Street. Yeah, on Canal Street. This, many people don't know, New Orleans is, or what, what are we, 303 years old? Yes. Yeah, 303 years old. The old, city, not the us. City, We're the not city. vampires. The, or anything yeah, like yeah, the city <laughs> of New Orleans, one, one of the oldest cities in the entire country because New Orleans existed before the United States. That's true. Like as we that yeah, because they had well, we were part of the Louisiana Purchase from the French. Yeah, French a, Fr a French colony originally, which is why there there's the French influence goes on to this day. And you know, it's funny. You remember when I got my ancestry DNA test? Mm -hmm. So when I looked at it, of course, no surprise. I'm very very white, a lot of European ancestry, but it was my French. And, uh, my French ancestors who came here, like they're specifically like in the thing that says that like my DNA is connected to some of the first French settlers in New Orleans. Yep, uh, I have I have French family roots here that go back before the Battle of New Orleans War of eighteen twelve. Myself, so so yes, if if you're born and raised in New Orleans, actually, regardless of whether you're you're white. You're, you're saying white or black, okay, you know, European American, African American, uh, there's a good chance you have some French blood. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Some yeah. some somewhere somewhere down there. Let's see, if the the French uh you know mixed mixed quite a bit down here. It's like three hundred years to do that, so <laughs> a yes. lot a lot happens in three hundred years. We 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 have a lot of mutts. Oh, yeah. A lot of European mutts down here. Uh, African mutts, too. All right. Well, be safe, be kind, and don't park next to vans. And remember, if it's dark, it's dangerous, and you don't feel safe, don't be there in the first place. And if you're ever talking to the police, not as a witness or a victim of a crime, lawyer up. <laughs>